In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Christ our God, grant us your wisdom, peace, and power, so that we may understand the word that you have implanted in your church. Through the witness of the apostles, and all the fathers, and the holy mothers, who have revealed to us, in their being deified, they have revealed to us your word through their apostolic vision. Help us to be faithful to that. Help us to be true. Help us to have it as a lamp kindled in our hearts and flaming us with the desire to serve you in all our ways, all our thoughts, and all our deeds. This we pray in your holy name, who together with the Father and the Holy Spirit are through all glory, honor, and adoration, God ever known to the ages of ages. Amen. Amen. Glory be to Jesus Christ. Glory, Glory forever. forever. Please be seated. <clears throat> I hope you don't mind if I stand during the daytime. It just seems fitting last night around the fire uh, to sit down. Uh, but if I don't stand, then I'm going to lose my concentration. This is far better. I teach at uh, our seminary and uh, and my students, if they were here, they're, in the, uh, they're back at the mission now. They'll tell you that I can go on and on and on and on. <laughs> and they, 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 they believe in eternity after one of my lives. <laughs> so, uh, I thought this morning that this will be the uh, doctrinal or theological heart of uh, what we wanted to talk about uh, this weekend. And uh, we want to talk about the meaning of sacrifice and what that means. And uh, sacrifice is, is obviously an important theme. Uh, and to introduce that, I wanted to tell you about something that happened a few years ago when a... Um, uh, an older gentleman came to me, and he came with a, compl a complaint about another priest. Did you ever get that kind of thing? Uh, and, and, and we we priests look at that with fear and trembling, and I immediately started to discourage him because I didn't want to hear any of this. And uh, and he imposed his complaint on me, and it was surprising. He said that he went to confession. And he didn't like his penance. And I asked him, what's wrong with your penance? <laughs> he said something that I never heard before and I haven't heard since, but he said, my penance was not bad enough. It wasn't severe enough. I wanted to do something big. I wanted to have to go on a pilgrimage. I wanted, uh, I wanted a rule that would really help me, and here's the kicker, help me pay back the wrongs that I had done. I thought, oh, you think penance is payback. How very Western of you. <laughs> Which it is. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned about that strange expectation of penance that he had by the penitent. Sometimes this uh, penitent asked for more severe penance if he thought that the therapy suggested by the priest is way too lenient. Such an expectation and a demand for hard penance, you know, is completely contrary to Orthodox tradition. Uh, we can't really demand of a priest penance. Uh, the Holy Councils have said that. We just can't do that. Uh, that kind of also indicates a spiritual problem that our Roman friends call over-scrupulosity. But I'm not going to talk about that today. That's really a lecture in a seminary that if you really want to hear it, you just come on down to Johnstown and we'll, uh, uh, we'll take you through that three hours. Actually, though, what we are left with is uh, a nagging impression that this is a sign of a larger problem. In this odd expectation of punishment, there seems to be the trace of a deeper expectation that sin is something that should be paid for and balanced out, that there is someone, with a, bit, a capital letter S, that there is someone who needs to be appeased 
or propitiated. That's the meaning of the word propitiation. It means appeasement. Uh, that someone or something needs satisfied. Uh, that sin is something that some sort of payment needs paid for in order to stave <laughs> off some impending doom or disorder or disaster or something. In other words, inescapable wrath. Today, I'd like to talk about this persistent idea that the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, and we all believe that that actually happened, but there's a persistent and rather new idea that this sacrifice of Jesus on the cross was a satisfaction of wrath, that it was a propitiation. In orthodoxy, uh, we've generally blamed a man by the name of Anselm as the one most responsible for this doctrine of satisfaction. And he, uh, namely, uh, he came up with a doctrine called substitutionary atonement. In his work, Cur Deus Homo, Latin, Cur Deus Homo, in this work, this 11th century Benedictine monk, writing in Canterbury, asserted that every single sin is an infinite violation of God's honor. And then this violation puts the sinner, then, in infinite debt to God. Just the tiniest violation puts you in infinite debt to God. Obviously, the debt is too much for a sinner to pay. So the only way that this infinite debt could be paid for is by the coming of a Redeemer whose absolute purity could discharge the debt of humanity. Hence, the title of Anselm's work, Cur Deus Homo, which means, Why the God-Man? Why the God-Man? Well, the reason why, Anselm says, is that it could only be the God-Man who could redeem and satisfy the debt of human sin. That's what Anselm said. The Orthodox theologian Vladimir Lasky, some, uh, some of you I'm sure have heard about him, he really sing, singles out and beats up on Anselm uh, for the guy who was the uh, whole reason why Western theology moved away from the patristic understanding moved away from the patristic understanding of the atonement and turned and made the whole West turn toward a legalistic, juridical, or courtroom view of salvation. It's interesting that uh, in his difficult book, uh, The Beauty of the Infinite by David Bentley Hart, anyone heard of him? A yeah, few, good. Uh, in this book, um, David Bentley Hart takes kind of criticizes Vladimir Lasky for taking Anselm out of context and for failing to acknowledge the nice fact that Anselm really is completely Trinitarian in his argument, like so many other Western authors were not. Hart is right to a degree. Anselm really is clear that the sacrifice of the cross is a gift. It's a gift that exceeds every debt. Nothing remains in the balance. Nothing remains to be unpaid for, and therefore you need to go to purgatory to kind of wipe out the rest of the debt. I think Hart, David Hart, tries too hard, however, to renovate Anselm's theory of substitutionary atonement. His attempt to reread Anselm's argument is more of a postmodern reinterpretation than an accurate explanation of what Anselm really said. I really do think that we have problems with Anselm's Cordeus Homo, no matter how much you try to renovate it. Contrary to Hart's best efforts, <coughs> Anselm's argument is made in a language that is strange to the ears of Eastern Orthodoxy, and it remains so. His words are not so much juridical as they are commercial. The terms debt and redemption and ultimately the word satisfaction, <clears throat> these are all marketplace terms. These are all taken straight out of Walmart or the Agora. 
these are all merchant terms. And one wonders that when these words were used in Scripture as they were, if they weren't really used as secondary terms, where the apostles and the Lord himself were using figures of speech to describe a reality that is, after all, undescribable. Our word for that is ineffable. So maybe these words like debt, uh, satisfaction, and redemption were really rhetorical metaphors used as picture words to drive home and describe a reality that just can't be described. The Bible does that all the time, doesn't it? Now, Jesus used parables to drive home a truth that really couldn't be fully contained in human language. This, I think, was Lasky's main problem with Anselm. In general, the Eastern Orthodox critique of all the Western <coughs> theories of the cross and the redemption, our critique of all those Western atonement doctrines really have to do with the problem of language. Theologians like Vladimir Lasky, who I love, Father Dimitrius Stanaloya, who I love, by the way, this is his year, uh, the Romanian Orthodox Church proclaimed uh, 2013 as the year of Father Dimitri Stanoloya, who was a wonderful confessor for the faith under the uh, terrible regime of Ceausescu. Uh, so theologians like Lasky, Stanoloya, and another wonderful theologian, Father John Romanidis, uh, from the uh, uh, Greek um, Archdiocese. Uh, and even David Bentley Hart, all these theologians have, have noticed a repeated problem in Western theology. <clears throat> what may have been meant as a descriptive term in Scripture, frequently taken in Western writing as the reality itself. Thus, when a courtroom setting is used by St. Paul to kind of uh, talk about redemption, uh, so, so Paul uses a courtroom setting. What happens then in Western theology, they're taking that to be a definition of way, the way things really are, of what ultimate reality is. And they say there really is a courtroom uh, in uh, the cosmos, where God is the judge, Jesus is the defense attorney, and the devil, obviously you're the plaintiff, <laughs> so am I, and the devil, uh, what do you think his role is in this whole framework? Do you remember Perry Mason? I don't know. Any, does anyone remember Perry Mason? Father and I remember Perry Mason. <laughs> He's the DA, uh, or the, the district attorney, or the prosecutor, right? The accuser. And so I, I suggest to you in the West, they believe that's, that is not just a picture. That's not just a metaphor, but that's the way things really are. To take an even more telling, more significant, and more historic example, when the lake of fire is used in, especially like the Apocalypse of St. John or Revelation, when the lake of fire is used to describe perdition in eternity, what do you think Western theology did with that? They took it and ran. They concluded, oh, uh, that means a literal, physical, created hell. Do you know what we think of hellfire in Eastern theology? Which is interesting. We say, no, that's not created. It's not a creature. This came out clearly in the Council of Florence when we were in big trouble and we were looking for uh, Western help to, uh, uh, to protect Constantinople. So we went all the way to Florence, and, uh, and in Florence, uh, the West said, well, what do you guys think of our uh, rather new doctrine of uh, hellfire and pur purgatory? What do you think of that? And our bishop said, uh, well, we don't think it's too cool. Uh, because, because we know that what is being described there is not created but rather it is the uncreated light. 
And those who repent and come to love God and their fellow man through Jesus Christ, they will experience that uncreated light as the purifying, healing, joyous light of heaven. But those who refuse that light, those who who reject God's love, experience the same condition as something entirely different. And that is the uh, condition of corrosive perdition, as Metropolitan Hirotheos Vlahos says uh, in his book Orthodox Psychotherapy. So you can see how over and over again the West says, oh, I know what the, the Bible's talking about. And we're going to take this and run the whole way and make of it as a, uh, as a statement of reality in itself. So there really is a courtroom in heaven. Uh, there really is a created thing called uh, the lake of fire. And there really is a sacrifice of wrath, which is more to do with what we're talking about today. Clearly, Anselm's argument suffers from not a few difficulties. Chief among them is this error of interpretation. But just as problematic is this simple question that I'd like to ask Anselm. Maybe I'll get a chance one day. Just who is this infinite debt to be paid to? Who are you going to pay? Uh, God? But why does God not simply forgive the debt? Because he already did. I think that happened in the parable of the unjust servant. Do you remember that story? <clears throat> Where a servant, two servants, you remember the parable. It's one of my favorite. Uh, one owes zillions and gazillions of dollars uh, to the king, and the other uh, owes just uh, uh, maybe... 10 bucks to the other servant and the king just to, goes just like that with the uh, death of the uh, unjust servant because he knows that this guy will never be able to come up with enough money and so he just says ah, forget about it and, uh, and the sad part of the story you know is that the unjust servant goes out He's uh, doing the spring and buck dance, you know, kind of kicking his heels a little bit. He's very happy that he's forgiven. The first thing he does when he sees his friend who owes him ten bucks, he takes him by the cowl of the neck and says, pay up now uh, or else. And he throws him in the debtor's prison and, uh, and God is not pleased. The fact remains, though, is that there the king just forgives the debt. Why couldn't God just forgive the infinite debt of sin in Anselm's terminology? I would like to ask him that. Um, after all, it, and, and really this, this parable, oddly enough, is the source of all these commercial terms that Anselm used. So we know that he knew this parable. So it kind of doesn't make sense. Of course, this question kind of leads us back to the question that should afflict us all and, and it's kind of give us a headache. Um, and it's a good headache. It'll generate lots of stuff. Um, sometimes headaches uh, help us see deeper uh, into good questions that we need to ask. And the question is this. Why couldn't God just forget about our sin and let it go? Why does it have to be dealt with? Why does our sin require something to be done? Why was the cross the response to our sin? It's a very good question. This is a central question. This, and, and you have to give Anselm credit for dealing with the question. We don't like his answer, but you have to give him credit. Because this is a question that the fathers certainly uh, uh, had their own headaches over. This is a central question that compelled the attention of not only Anselm, but certainly all the fathers who thought about redemption. It also became the critical occasion in which Western theology 
displayed some of its most egregious, some of its worst moments, in which it revealed a closer affinity, a a closeness to the violent narratives of the world, rather rather than to the infinitely peaceful narrative of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm thinking here primarily uh, when we talk about egregious moments. I'm thinking here primarily of the doctrine that Lasky was really complaining about, as opposed to his beating up on poor Anselm. Instead of the commercial doctrine of substitutionary atonement, uh, Lasky and the Orthodox critique are really complaining about the Reformed doctrine of penal substitution. That's what we're really complaining about. Anselm is not such a bad guy. I'm willing to let him go a little bit. So we'll we'll just say, okay, Anselm, uh, you're not so bad. We'll let you in the porch, okay? (laughs) What I think they're really complaining about, what orthodoxy has the most problem with, is the Reformed or Protestant doctrine of penal substitution. This kind of hits home for me because this is how I was trained. This is what I was taught not only in seminary, this is what I heard my dad preach from his pulpit all my life. And I was from a boy from boyhood to teenagerhood. This is what we heard in the Protestant church. Any form any Protestants or former Protestants in here? Oh, quite a few. Okay. <laughs> This is what we heard, didn't we? Uh, Maybe I'll describe it and then we'll have deja vu all over again. This is the theory that Christ was punished or penalized, hence penal in the uh, title, penal substitution. This is the theory that Christ was punished in the place of sinners, that he was punished. He was substituted in their place, thus satisfying the demands of justice so that God could then justly forgive their sins. Punishment had to happen. So Jesus took the punishment for us. So let us be fair to Anselm here and not blame him for this argument. To be sure, this, uh, this extreme doctrine uh, kind of derived from substitutionary atonement but it's really the work of the Protestant Reformation, especially from the lawyerly pen of John Calvin. It's really Calvin where we really get this doctrine of penal substitution uh, marked out plainly and clearly. It's not hard to understand this whole idea of someone, of the uh, judge needing to punish someone, and so someone's going to have to take the rap. And so uh, someone (coughs) takes our place. That idea is not hard to understand because it comes out from common sense. This is the way the world runs, doesn't it? Uh, One example ought to confirm this universal expectation of penal substitution. And so one need look no further, surprisingly, for a good example, than from the pen of Mark Twain. Heard of him, Mark Twain? Uh, Huck Finn, Tom Sawyer, we we cut our teeth on that one. He wrote another book, though. He wrote a book called The Prince and the Pauper. Does anyone? Okay, good, good. So that rings a bell. In this wonderful book about um, uh, two guys finding out that they're each other's doppelgangers, they look like each other, and here one is a pauper and one one is Prince Edward. Uh, the popper's name is Tom. And so they decide on a lark to s- just switch places. You, know, you, you live the life on the streets, uh, uh, and you'd be me, and I will be a prince. And so we'll, uh, uh, we'll get back together and, and exchange notes. So when Tom, who is the popper, is living the life of uh, the prince, who's Edward, he obviously needs help. So he doesn't know how to act like a prince. And here he finds out that Edward has a nice friend, a friend who kind of helps him uh, play the role of the prince. And who is this friend? I don't know his name, but his friend is Prince Edward's whipping boy. 
a whipping boy. I couldn't believe how true to fact and history the whipping boy is. He really had these guys. You know, do you know what the theory of the whipping boy is? That uh, uh, the, the tutor uh, or the teacher or the pedagogue of the prince, when he's taking him to, through his lessons, and the whipping boy is right there who's a friend of the prince, so uh, he's giving the prince his lessons. Let's say the, uh, the prince is irresponsible and procrastinates and doesn't get his paper in on time. That never happens anymore. It <laughs> must have happened only then. And let's say that he completely fails his lessons. So what did they do back then? Uh, well, the uh, tutor beats <coughs> the student, right? But what if that student is a prince? Can't really do that. Can't touch the royal body. Uh, so it's, it goes in, in uh, Old England. And so what does the uh, headmaster do? He has to beat someone, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's what the whipping boy is for. <laughs> because the headman has to beat someone. And so the whipping boy then um, uh, works for his bread and board. Uh, and he allows himself, even though he didn't do it, he stands in the place of the uh, malefactor. He stands in the place of the prince and takes the uh, whipping. The job of the whipping boy was to take the place of the prince whenever corpor uh, corporal punishment was doled out by the tutor. In effect, the whipping boy was an innocent substitute who took the penalty instead of the one who deserved it. Hence, penal substitution. In this theory, there is suggested an answer to that nagging question. You remember the headache question? Why couldn't God just forget about it? So the answer from this theory would be, intriguingly, that God cannot neglect the demands of justice without contravening his nature of perfect justice. So if God says, just forget about it, then he's no longer being true to his own nature, and he kind of self-contradicts and falls apart. Which is a very small view of divine nature, if you ask me. So it's not difficult to critique this view, and one certainly has to do so if they're going to be faithful to Orthodox Holy Tradition. Well, later on, in the more positive second half, after our break, it's going to be more positive. Uh, we're just, I'm just going to bum you out in this one. Uh, <laughs> might as well tell them. You know? <laughs> in the second half, we're going to think hard about the narrative of the sacrifice of Christ in holy tradition. So it's going to be much better. But permit me right now to briefly note a few problems that emerge from this Western theory of penal substitution. Let us consider right off the bat, as I've said before, that this doctrine is the default belief of heterodox North American Christianity. That's what is preached in 90% of all the pulpits in all uh, the churches in, in the United States and Canada and, and Mexico. Just a few weeks ago, in the Western observance of Easter and the last Sunday of March, it was this argument that lay as the basis for almost every sermon about what happened on Good Friday. First problem. There is the notion that the divine wrath is a passion that is provoked by human sin and that provocation necessitates a response by God. Human sin makes necessary God's anger. And that anger then must be completely expressed. Right there, this notion obviously puts God under necessity. Uh, and that's a problem in, in and of itself, but it puts him under the necessity of provocation. And, and if that thing cannot be done if God is God. God is completely free. God is not limited by any necessity by any boundary. 
uh, we have this thing called the apophatic tradition that says God is beyond all our definitions. He's beyond all our thought. There is no way that we can ever say that God needs us or God needs us to do anything. One time he told the psalmist, he's, uh, and Isaiah in particular also, he said, you people have this bad idea that all your sacrificed animals are feeding me as if I'm hungry? He said, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I don't need your sacrifices. I'd rather you be obedient. That'd be much better than all your festivals and all your services and all your sacrifices. So, we cannot do anything that necessitates a movement by God. So, if the divine nature is free, then God cannot be provoked. God cannot be necessitated. And, by the way, this notion of human sin provoking God's wrath imposes a very human, indeed a fallen human, character of anger upon the divine nature. And God, there's no passion in divine nature. That's, and there's no change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Secondly, second problem, there is the notion that punishment actually is able to satisfy the demands of justice. Is that true? Can punishment, even in our dark world, if you punish a criminal and get all your anger out, let's say that you in your nightmares can do everything you want to to someone who hurt you, is that going to fix you? If I know that, and, and I'm fallen, and you know that, if we know that being sinful, then why would we suggest that punishment somehow satisfies God? That it always bothered me. Why is, if my mom tells me, don't be mad, Jonathan, why is God someone who doesn't get that same message? Why are we suggesting that God is of a lower nature than us if we know ourselves that we can't take revenge? So, who said that punishment of a criminal can adequately repair the damage of a crime? I know this resonates with the very contemporary discussion of the penal system and jurisprudence in the courts. We talk about that ad nauseum, ad infinitum to this day. But that is precisely my point. If there remains some skepticism about the effectiveness of the penitentiary and secular law, how much more should we question the place of penal punishment in the realm of theology? Third problem. There is the notion that somehow the sun, here's a real kicker, there's a notion that somehow in this penal substitutionary doctrine, that somehow the son puts himself in opposition to the father as the one who becomes sin as a substitute, and he places himself as a target of punishment that must come. And on the other hand, the father directs his just wrath against his son. He unleashes a tempest of infinite pain upon the crucified victim who falls under the aggregate, totally accumulated weight of all the penalty, of all the sin, of every man, woman, boy, girl, for all the ages. And finally, at the extremity of this dereliction, at the extremity of this punishment, Jesus cries out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, or my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In this doctrine of penal substitution, the interpretation is that indeed God the Father did just that. He forsook his Son. It's the logical extremity. That's the logical extension 
of the doctrine of penal substitution, that God the Father somehow, despite all the things we've heard about the Holy Trinity, somehow forsook his Son. Well, the good news here is that St. Athanasius is quick to lay this notion to rest. In his work, The Discourse Against the Arians, St. Athanasius, from a small town, I think, called Alexandria, Egypt, (laughs) he asserts the divinity of the Son to his opponents, and he emphasizes the constant, continual unity between the Father and the Son. Here's what Athanasius, St. Athanasius the Great, here's what he said about those terrible, heartbreaking words of Jesus on the cross. St. Athanasius said, Neither can the Lord Jesus ever be forsaken by the Father. The Lord Jesus, who is always in the Father. Even then, even at the cross. It is interesting that Athanasius wrote these words in the context of an argument against who? Which heretics? The The Arians. The Arians. I say this is interesting because it seems to me that there is at least a latent Arianism running through this notion of the Father and Son placed on opposite sides of a penal transaction of justice. I mean, I wouldn't tell that to your Lutheran friend. And I I, I quiver about bringing this up in my Thanksgiving dinner with the rest of my Protestant family. So, oh, I know where that doctrine came from, and it's partly Aryan. So maybe when I get really old and brave, I'll do that. (laughs) In Orthodox tradition, this is what I talk about with my family, though. I try not to be negative, I try to be true to our positive witness. And that is this. In Orthodox Holy Tradition, the peaceful, beautiful fellowship of the Holy Tradition remains unbound, unchecked, uninterrupted, even at the extremity of the cross. And, I might add, especially at the extremity of the cross. The knowledge of the Holy Trinity as peace and infinite beauty is established right at the worst place possible, right at that horrible singularity of sin and death, at the cross, and all the way down to the extreme dereliction of hell itself, where Jesus in his human soul proclaims the lightning dawning truth in the darkness that he has completely assumed and transfigured sin and death in his own humanity in his own divinity. When Jesus, when scripture says as it does that Jesus became sin for us, it did not do so in the sense that Jesus became the criminal and became the object of punishment. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21, which is a favorite reference of John Calvin, St. Paul writes, for our sake He made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In this sense, Jesus did not become sin in his nature. He did not become sin essentially. Instead, the sense that St. Paul was using here was that Jesus completely assumed the full measure of the aggregate consequence of sin the terrible, horrifying aspect of all the cost, of all the pain, of all sin for all time. And Jesus did not do so, so that he would become the single convict who alone would go to the gallows. Jesus assumed the burden of sin for all time, so that by his death, sin would be loosed for all time. In the Western narratives, Jesus was envisioned as the substitute whipping boy for all humanity. See how their story goes. 
but in Orthodox holy tradition, there's no doubt that there was a whipping and there was a hanging tree. We don't doubt that at all. But my point is, is that it wasn't God doing the whipping. Let that kind of float out there. (laughs) It wasn't God doing the whipping. It was sin. Sin does that all by itself. Sin is its own cloud of Hades. Sin carries its own grief, its own suffering, its own pain, its own distortion, its own degeneration. So what did the whipping, what did the infliction of pain? It was sin. Jesus didn't sin, but he became sin for us. He took it all, and it was sin doing the whipping. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. After a break, we'll uh, go to the second half.